And welcome back to an impromptu, what I'm going to call section two of Kevin's criticism of my truth bomb riff about the Clean New Deal that I laid down there, where he um, wanted to lay out things that he didn't agree with, um, you know, specifically so that we could further discuss publicly where our each other's come froms are to hopefully work in a way that I think both of us as an adult, as adults and Americans realize that we can agree to disagree without absolutely losing our minds and polarizing to the point that we still can't work in unison and cohesion to try to get to the bigger uh, problem that we both agree to and why Kevin's been so kind to uh, to become my colleague, to become a friend, to become somebody that drives uh, forward to, to hopefully demonstrate the importance of what we're trying to achieve collectively called the Clean New Deal. But on that note, I want to start off because I think it's an interesting conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll first, you know, uh, what, what, what does Star Trek say um, when he does the the, the log notes? Um, is it Stardate? Stardate, Tuesday, February 6th, 2024, approximately 3 p.m. Pacific, uh, Mountain Time, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. And my name is Patrick Lovell. I'm the uh, producer of The Con. You can find it at www thecon.tv we've provided it for free because the only thing americans buy are lies and um the the american dream dies where power lies and kevin and i both are aware of that and kevin is my good friend and colleague and brings a lot of uh brain matter and bandwidth to the conversation and again like you we're busy we're all involved with millions of things i've just had 100 calls today having nothing to do with this but we're going to try to demonstrate that yeah as busy as we are we can find time to talk about the most incredibly important thing that's happening to America at this moment. And on that note, let me just kind of tee it up this way, uh, Kevin. Where we left off was some of the things that um, you had drawn um, criticism to for the idea that you don't want us to be vulnerable to a, to a way that, that collapses my credibility by way of stuff that you recognize that I have become sort of the preeminent guy that can deliver the goods that nobody else is going to, but you're also very cautious and maybe strategic to a degree, which is extremely important. But, you know, why, you know, what, what's the term, you know, don't, it'll come back to me, my head's all over the place. But the yeah. bottom line is, there's no need to unnecessarily create quandaries where we can drive the context to the, the point uh, that that we need to get to. But at the same time, it was worth discussing because we're in the midst of this potential conflagration in a, in a uh, you know, in an increase in, you know, the conflicts in the Middle East that have been going on, you know, back to your time in the 90s in Gulf War One. But, you know, obviously post 9-11 have, have really become uh, quite incredible. And, um, you know, we were talking in our last um discussion about 9-11 and the causation and the differentiation and the very specifics come from of you know american boots on the ground and um bases in saudi and what that means to the likes of those like bin laden and and it, what everything that came from there one thing i do want to just say at the very basis of uh, at the outset of this ironically i did make a statement about rico and racketeering where i defined it as racketeering influenced conspiracy organization which i thought was really funny because obviously i know rico inside and out it's racketeering influenced corrupt organization which as a whole is a conspiracy and so the idea is what we're trying to move in is yeah people there's a lot of people moving losing their minds because we haven't solved a lot of riddles and so people do go into conspiracy la la land sometimes but that does not negate the conspiracy that we're trying to reveal to you that does have a complete control on everything so starting there your time to uh, move forward from there. And I don't know if we just button up 9-11 and Saudi and move on yeah. to the next subject. Yep, exactly. And Patrick, before we, so that everyone understands what's going on here. Patrick, you know, we are we are shoulder to shoulder in this battle, in this, in this you know, to, to, to bring the truth to the American public, right? So just imagine I am your left tackle. You are our quarterback. You are our quarterback. I am our left tackle. And let me tell you, the people we're going after right now, they got 11 in the box. They're coming. They're, they're going to come at us in every which way because we are upsetting the apple cart and restoring sovereignty to the American public by giving them the power of knowledge. Knowledge. And you have that knowledge. 
And so this, this, we're just talking about an email I sent you because I know with the way they're going to come at us, once people see what information you have to offer, is they're going to try to upend your credibility however they can, by any means necessary. And we know that's going to happen. You know, again, there's too many of them. They got 11 in the box. So as their left tackle, I mean, I, I got one leg throwing out, one elbow throwing out. I'm squeezing this guy. I'm holding this guy, but, but the referees can't see. You know what I'm saying? And so on, on that, in that vein, we have the war in Ukraine. And so here you are riffing again, right? And and I love it. I love it because you, you're you drawn on so much knowledge. And you, you made a simple reference and it seems subtle, but this is the kind of stuff they blow you up on, right? Right. You said that you described Ukraine as, as an ally of NATO. Okay, right. And at the heart of the matter, it, the reason why that is inaccurate as an ally of, it, it is the issue that is the red line for Russia is that you, Ukraine, that NATO is wanting to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, right? And that the way the prevailing narrative says, I, I'm already out of bounds, right? Because they're acting as if, you know, people, you know, the net prevailing narrative indicates that, you know, the question is whether NATO would add, would add Ukraine. But no, NATO has intentionally gone through a process and the United States has intentionally gone through a process of influencing the internal politics of Ukraine to shift them from NATO neutral, which was a part of their constitution going into 2014, and shift them to a, to a government that wants to join NATO. This has been a red line of Russia for 20 years. <laughs> we know this, right? And so what, 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 where I was trying to say, okay, so this is, uh, I view this as a factual error, is that is it begs the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that, that it's over whether Ukraine can join NATO, not that Ukraine is an ally of NATO. The significance, and it seems like a subtle difference, the significance is every member of NATO, any attack on every member of NATO is an attack on the United States of America, unlike an ally per se. Russia can deal with <laughs> Ukraine being an ally. What they can't deal with is that if they have a dispute with Ukraine, now they're going to nuclear war against the United States. That's why they have to attack before Ukraine becomes a member of NATO. And so I know you know that. Wait, 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 wait. You know. Hold on a second. No, that is so incredibly important because I did not understand that. So again, I'm learning from you. Thank you. I acknowledge because that's said. Wow, that is so interesting because it makes a lot makes a lot makes sense. I'll I'll I'll, I'll tee up some of my perspective and everything else. And it all kind of stems back to what I still think is outdated thinking of Cold War sort of uh, chess playing, which it's a different world. It has been a different world since the late 90s. But I look at it through a lot of the prism and trust me, I acknowledge, look, I know what we did with the Nord Stream pipeline, right? I understand with the, 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 the comparison of apples to apples of what we might do if the Russians had nuclear missiles on our border in Mexico, um, of the threat that would happen to us. And, and some of those things that we've heard throughout, I was always aware of the Ukrainian corruption and some of the players within Ukraine, both that leaned Moscow and others that were, it, it seems like a, a, a lot, a big mess, but then my sort of bigger contextualization, like I think everything that I frame is in the modern era based on some piece of the puzzle within the global economy that gives certain elements more leverage in the way I was kind of responding. And I, and I, again, I don't have a lot of passion about this, this situation that we could talk about, you know, I have a lot of fault with Putin. I have a lot of fault with NATO. I, I don't look at it as the same story, but at the same time, again, my, my come from through everything, just to make the point at the moment mm -hmm. is that I am so past exporting democracy on behalf of the United States is kind of a catch-all when we're not a we're not a democracy, and the in, in the conflagration of terms that Biden is going to save us from Trump's threat to save democracy is ridiculous because of everything that we're revealing by way of 
are revelations of who actually controls the country and why. So I'll just leave it at that and let you continue. But I really do appreciate the point because I, it never occurred to me that Putin preempted the, and I should have known this, and I feel really ignorant for not knowing this because that is not amplified day in and day out on the front page of the New York Times. That is not amplified day in and day out in all the dialogue to remind us that Ukraine is not a full born member of NATO. That's right. It, 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 you know, and, and so if, and so I, the, the backstory, and again, this has little to do with what you were actually saying. So we've already covered the issue. Like I said, it's these little threats it, they, they because they're big geopolitical issues because we are talking you are going to reveal in the con and the new and, and the new untouchables what you are revealing there is the truth behind the lies okay so so here we go so anyone who has the truth behind the lies right people are going to have to start believing you because they've been told a lot of lies that they have accepted for a long time, right? And 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 this is why your credibility is so important. So if they can show, if they can show that you no, know, you don't really understand the truth because you find you, this this error or that error, that's what they're going to try to do. The Yahtzee, make that, yes, make that lift harder. And so that's what this was about with the Ukraine thing. But the but but this is talking about the the war in Ukraine is an excellent opportunity to talk about the magnitude of the lies that we're told, right? It, okay, because everything about the prevailing narrative about the war in Ukraine suggests that Russia is the aggressor. They, they, they're, they've been characterized at the basis of the global economic embargo against Russia, right? Is the fact that they attacked Ukraine for no reason. Other than other than other than ex Russian expansion, right? That kind of thing, right? When, at the very minimum, at the very minimum, right? The case for that that the that Ukraine would join NATO is is a red line for Russian national security has been well known going back to the Obama administration and well known before that. Obama did not support and it's a matter of public record ukraine joining nato because he said this was a red line for russia in terms of their national natural security in terms of having a security buffer right that, that we as americans should be well versed on what a security buffer is because we are the country that established in the modern era the security buffer the monroe doctrine was established in 18, the 1840s, which claims the entire Western Hemisphere, North and South America, as the security buffer for the United States. This is why the Soviet Union putting missiles in Cuba was a violation was a violation of our national security. So if that's our posture, we certainly can't say we don't understand that it's in the national security in interests of Russia not to have NATO on their border. But why are we doing it? But we are doing it. We are we've pushed NATO through the old Warsaw Pact, which used to be a security buffer for the former Soviet Union. We've pushed NATO all the way east, right? And they have complained with every country we add, right? It is in their national security interest. You could debate whether Putin has globalist goals and stuff like that. But at the very minimum, it's 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 it, it, if if we NATO is not a friend of Russia. So if, if to push it to, um, to say that you don't see how that would be a problem when they keep on saying this is the problem, when they said that they would settle the war in Ukraine two months in, you know, if Ukraine would, you know, would once again commit to being neutral, never to joining NATO, you know, we're going to settle some land issues because the you, you because what happened back in 2014 is complicated you know so they're not giving back that land in the Donbars and Donbass and stuff like that but other than that the linchpin was NATO expansion and so so that is so contrary to the narrative that we've been told right we, you know we are the aggressors here they are not if if someone is forcing their way into your into your through your security buffer to your border you're not the aggressor if you defend yourself 
That's what they're doing. And Ukraine absolutely knows that the condition of their independence back in the 90s was that they wouldn't join NATO. That's why they put it in their constitution. And for most of the time that Ukraine has been a free country, Russia has not been involved in their domestic politics and they, and they chose to be neutral. They honored the, the condition of their independence, right? So this is all I'm saying. That is the actual fact. That's verifiable. I, I don't, and, I don't, I don't deny or debate or I, I, I've just learned uh, in a way that just made me, it kind of stopped me in my tracks, kind of eureka to a degree, but it also lends itself to a lot of questions. Is it okay? If, of course, let's do it. Okay, because <laughs> you know, I, I, I got to ask just straight questions without, you know, inserting my op-ed because, because <laughs> I don't want to twist this into a. But but it's it's such a fascinating construct, okay? So that we don't get get it twisted, we yeah. know that Putin is a, a murderer. Okay, we yeah, know but, that before, Putin, but yeah, before I get to nice that, I, pre I appreciate you saying that in a very <laughs> big way, in a monumental way, because that's that's central to the whole thing. But but he's not just a murderer; he's not a thug murderer in a in a in a in a Hitler esque sort of just murder everybody for the sake. He's a very strategic in intelligence, yes. be, you know, geopolitical. Ruthless, ruthless. Yeah. And, and again, my, 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 my context begins with Putin in 1998 with long-term capital management because of the derivatives that shorted the ruble that created a run that basically enabled let's just call it the bankruptcy of the former Soviet empire, which imploded upon itself. So I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, Putin knew exactly what wall street was at that time period. And I think he always packed it away. And I think over the course, here I go. But you would, you would say that that was wall street doing in Russia. Th that's what I just said. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. they the ruble. And so I'm yeah. thinking in the back of my head that in a weird way, because we know that Yeltsin was deeply embedded with a lot of criminal uh, apparatuses, right? We know that there was so, that this this huge struggle for power, and 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 you know, it, like there always is in a vacuum of a massive economic upheaval, right? And then here comes the vestiges of the former KGB that probably, and it reminds me of the CIA because I think we can learn a lot about the KGB because they were working with a lot of mob-like forces in, in 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 the territory of the motherland and as has the cia from the very beginning as a bulwark but through right-wing fascist sort of you know going back to world war ii right and i mean it, a lot of the the underworld i mean we're talking about massive uh, uh racketeering we're talking about massive um uh sex trafficking we're talking about massive gun running i mean this has been going on for decades and decades and both intelligence agencies were up to their eyeballs in this so here it becomes Putin to become the president of the Russian empire. And then he just, you know, gets more and more entrenched. And as we see this thing moving forward, we got a couple of, um, you know, insights into Putin, for example, you said he was a murderer, but there's more in terms of there was a big anti-homosexual movement in Russia, I think in about, as I recall, 2008 to 2010. Do you remember that? I mean, they were like, do you know what I'm talking I, about? I, no, I, I was not very familiar with okay, that. The only, I reason I, the only reason I bring it up, though, the only reason I bring it up is because I've observed throughout the last several decades that Putin has inferred that there's a elitist cabal in the West. OK, Defer, determine, I mean, you know, interpret what you mean by that. But of course, this guy is a master of compromise and all of those things that came with KGB. And then, oh, yeah, we know that. Here I am trying to avoid all of the stuff, and I apologize. I should just get to the point, and I just should ask you honest questions. But it's it's it, they are honest because I think you can get me there because you can track on all this stuff. But look, we know Trump had some ridiculous, um, uh, uh, you know, beauty pageant that he was involved with in Moscow. Yes, the, yes, the universe, the, the the Miss Universe. Right. Did and he know? was always yeah. trying to develop relationships to get Trump hotels and all this stuff in Russia. And we know who Trump is, you know, the history of Trump in terms of his development deals. But meanwhile, what we didn't know at that time was that Russia was extracting a ton of wealth and they were exporting through their oligarchs billions and billions of dollars through currency trades and everything else into Western markets, into real estate in London, in the city, yeah. with New York. And all of these other things. So what I'm trying to piecemeal here together, based on what you just said, that 
we just saw Tucker Carlson, and I haven't seen the interview, make the trip to Moscow. And just take me through, because I could go on forever, about this these really questionable tactics and Trump and mob and under, you know, all of these criminal sort of syndicates and propaganda, given just the straightforward sort of nature of what you mentioned by way of the red line in Ukraine. Can you, can you give me a sort of big picture analysis of, of what you consider Putin, Ukraine, Russia, Trump in 2024? I think, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it goes to the complexity. It goes to the complexity of people in power, of, of all of us, quite frankly, whether you are the, you're in power or not. The, 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 the thread there is, is that while there is corruption, I mean, in other words, Putin is a complicated character, right? We know he is a murderer. We know he's former KGB. We know he's, he, you know, he, his hold on power, 20 years in the Soviet Union, whether he was officially in charge or not, he was in charge. Right, but if right. he was insane, we would have already experienced nuclear war. He's not insane. No, no he's not insane. No, he's he's not insane. What I'm saying, the, the thread is, is that, is that, yes, when it comes to basic issues of national security, right, he's going to function like we would function, like anyone else would function. When it, but okay, when it comes to serving his own interests, he's going to do that ruthlessly and, and without anyone's interest but his own in mind. He demonstrates that, you know, when it comes, you know, to leveraging what Russia has, Russia is is it is far wealthier than the than the United States when it comes to natural resource. The natural resource within their country, right? The oil, the, I mean the the the, the diamonds, the, I mean the, the, the essential minerals, minerals. The forest. I mean, yeah, they are a huge, huge source of, of resource, but they need the challenge has always been how do you how do you how do you um, extract extract well yes how do you how do you monetize it? Right, and so yes, he's he's absolutely um, the the tangle web associated with how he tries to do that and the context which he tries to do that. Why? Because Western forces like the United States and our allies, right, are are wanting to manage how those natural resources are integrated into the Western system. Why? Because they can upturn whole markets. You know, for years, uh, De Beers in South Africa had a had a corner on the diamond market, right? Okay, and that was allowed to fester because they were a part of the West. You know, okay, fine. Russia has far more diamonds than they did if they flood the diamond market. You, you see what it would do. Yeah, so right. What about to... gold out of curiosity? Because I know they have the, the largest, uh, I think, stash of gold on the planet. Well, this is, this is what I'm saying. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And so, so yes, as it, so Russia, as they wanted after the dismantling of the Soviet Union, after they stood down in, in 91, right, 1991, they wanted to be reintroduced like Germany and Japan, right, right? It is, it is the United States, essentially based on the choices that we made, who chose to keep them at arm's length. Why? Because the potential of integrating Russia into the, you know, in, into the Western system is to make them one of the wealthiest countries, if not the wealthiest country. Interesting. Because of, because of their natural resources. Interesting. So so, Interesting. So they're Therefore, on. bricks, right? Yeah, well, okay. So, okay, what I'm just saying about sticking on Putin is that he's a complicated person. And and that we, it is, it is, in other words, he's not all, he's not just evil. We, if we, this is a part of the, the problem with the polarization of our public discourse is that we make people irredeemable. They're just evil. There's nothing good about them. Not, let us not forget that the, that the reason why we were able to negotiate the Iranian nuclear deal, right, was because Russia agreed, Putin agreed to enrich Iranian uranium. You know, words, Iran has enough uranium to develop their own nuclear program, right? We didn't want them to do that. So the Obama administration negotiated a deal to say, okay, give us your uranium, right? Now, right, Iran is not going to give up their uranium to anyone. They would only give it up to a country they trust. On the other hand, the United States is not going to have 
that uranium in the wrong hands. So they're only going to give it to a government they trust, right? Both parties agreed that that government who had the sophistication was Russia, was Putin. Again, so I didn't know that part of the, the analysis. Oh, yes. It, so Russia, and it was Interesting. Working. Russia was enriching Iranian uranium, say that too many times, right? So yeah. that it could only be used well for energy. Yeah. Right. It couldn't be used for nuclear weapons. Right. And P Putin was doing it. So that's what I'm saying. He's not he the, in that context. Russia if the U.S. Is, trusted him is all you need to say, really. OK, so that's what I'm that well, we obviously did. Yeah. All right. So now, but that really makes things really interesting. OK, because, yeah. OK, again, who's in charge and why? All right. So who's in charge of the United States? Wall Street's in charge of the United States. All right. 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 So everything dovetails from there to your point about, you know, potentially Russia monopolizing different markets and what that means to the West. And if they could control it, see, that's that's another aspect of this. And I'm like, OK, we had leverage because the Russians kind of overextended, but yet they in the ruble. And the, I mean, and so you would think, you know, obviously bricks. Right. I mean, that makes all the sense in the world. But let me go revert back to my other question, because. I know you have the answer for that, and maybe you want to bring that into the into this sort of discussion. But again, what, what I find almost brilliantly orchestrated by Putin, and again, I find him to be, because I go back, I'll give you an example. So many years ago, uh, there was a documentary called Icarus, where they had discovered that Putin and the Russians were doping all of their Olympic athletes and how they controlled yeah. the, the Olympic International Steering Committee and everything else, and how he just cuts off all the corners and just creates a vertical to where he has complete control because that's how he operates. Okay. And again, I'm thinking KGB, right? But yeah. it's it's like when people get poisoned and people get killed, it's either because they betrayed Putin or yeah. they went sideways and he needed them. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the guy is that's ruthless right. when it comes to his end game, right? So oh, yeah. You know, let's just say he's a pragmatist. He's a pragmatist in, in many ways, but he also happens to be the richest guy on the planet. And I think a lot of guys, at least that might be debatable, but a lot of people have been suggesting he's by far the richest guy on the planet, L liquid right now, without all the resources being in the market. I'm, I'm, I right. think, and most of it is oil, by the way. Okay, so <laughs> just 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 band with me on this. Okay, so over the course of the last, I'm going to call it 12 years. I've observed what appears to be this, okay? So going back to the 50s, we've had the John Birch Society. Most of the John Birch Society were Texas oil businessmen. There were millionaires that wanted to extend the sort of Jim Crow sort of scenario by any means necessary by infiltrating what was going on in government and politicians they could control and judges and so forth, okay? That surprised people. This is what the Kochs picked up on and got very good at. And by the way, because it's relevant, Fred Koch, not to be confused with Fred Trump, Fred Koch made his initial fortune because he was the guy that introduced all the refinery technology to Stalin, which was the largest producer of oil in the world, larger than Saudi Arabia post-2008. And that was where all the big battles of the Nazis took place before Stalingrad. I mean, it's humongous. That's what Hitler was trying to get, by the way, was those oil resources. And had he done that, it might have been game over, by the way. But yeah. the long and the short of it is that... Putin has always had a material alignment with a lot of the right wing oil billionaires from the United States. Now, of course, we had the Cold War. We were juxtaposition and odds and everything else. But fast forward through this crazy, chaotic world of the last three decades, but particularly post 9-11. And I've looked at this, this sort of like all of the chess pieces changing. And of course, Putin's not a communist. <laughs> Not even remotely, right? right. The, guy's, the guy's a crime boss in, in many ways, but he's also very pragmatic. And, you know, and he knows what leverage he has. And so to that point, in terms of the psyops and compromise and everything else, when you look at the right wing billionaire class that's been deeply involved with the Supreme Court on one side of the equation, I mentioned John Birch through the Koch brothers, the white right wing billionaires were Johnny come lately to Trump. They weren't on board with Trump back in 2016. They weren't on with Trump ever, but they are now. Okay, at least at least loosely, I think it looks that way based on a lot of these things that I'm seeing. Again, I'm theorizing. I'm not talking about from a basis of I've got the evidence again to to, to you know to mess with my own credibility. I'm just speculating based on what I'm looking at to what I think is a rational approach. But then again, I'm teeing this up because you might have some thread the needle that'll take me to the next level, which I have a feeling you will. 
So when you consider the right white wing billionaire class that has a functionality of fossil fuel at its big core that drives the whole thing, by the way. And again, we've talked in previous uh, dialogue about the importance of the dollar as the world's reserve currency connected to Saudi as the swing producer and everything that that elicits. Consider for a moment Putin having allies. That's why I brought up the whole anti uh, homosexual movement in Russia 28 to 2014 that I'm aware of. I know there was a lot of hoopla on this, but he's been uh, inferring and discussing sort of a white, um, you know, Christian sort of um, uh, global, I think, paradigm that undergirds a lot of things that have moved right post, let's say, you know, 2016, right? We've seen a lot of move uh, to all of these. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, so fill in for me what I'm talking about, particularly when we get to the nature of Tucker Carlson. Okay, because Tucker Carlson, you and I could discuss this all day, but I want to see how you respond to this because he just went to Russia. There's talk whether or not he's going to get back into the United States. But at the same time, and we did know that CNN interviewed freaking Osama bin Laden. Okay, so there's that. But yeah. we're talking about a very, very smart, incredibly uh, ruthless, and and I think incredibly strategic thinker in Putin. Try to put that into to make me understand who he is and, and what we're looking at from where you from where you're sitting. Well, I think this is all a part of the this is all a part of from the Putin perspective. I think this is all a part of the um, unipolar, multipolar tension I mean, that we are experiencing currently. I mean, you know, where Taiwan is not the reason why. China is the greatest threat to the United States. You know, it is the fact that China can be a superpower like the United States. Can you States. hold on one second? I got to yeah. pause this. Somebody's knocking my door. Hold on one second. Oh, go right ahead. Okay, we're back. Please pick up. Sorry for the interruption. Not a problem at all. So, yeah, so what I was basically saying is, is I believe that to the extent that Putin would allow himself to be uh, interviewed by Tucker Carlson, this is a part of the effort to explain in a context where I think there is a growing critical mass in the world against the, the United States being the sole superpower. I think that that is the case in our allies. And I think that's the case with the American public. And I think Putin sees that that as that he has an opportunity if he can humanize the what they you know the the narrative that describes him as just seek the, the next Hitler or some such nonsense, right? And that and that Tucker Carlson may be the kind of interviewer who they can have a really thoughtful conversation, you know, because that is the only interest that I see him talking to the West about talking across the Tucker is talking to the West right and and the evidence that I see that there's a, a broader receptivity both with the governmental allies of the United States and with people the citizens of not only the United States but certainly in Europe is look at the, look at the interest that countries have in joining BRICS so BRICS expanded. Right. This is this is another set of countries that are that are endeavoring to set set up an international system of trade using a different currency as 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 the basis for international trade. You know, so so uh, you know, so so uh, Brazil, you know, India, Russia, China, uh, South Africa. Right. OK. OK. Now they have they expanded and they put out sort of like a, a request. Anyone who's interested in joining BRICS, you know, tell us and then we'll decide. And, and, and a lot of countries did, including France, right? Okay, as a NATO partner, it wanted to join BRICS. They decided to add six. So now it's BRICS plus six, right? In those six- That's Saudi. Is, oh. That's Saudi, that's Iran, right? <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, so okay. I mean, the, okay. So, so my point is, is that okay. they are trying to normalize 
a multipolar world. Right. And 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 so and I think he this is what he's trying to if he exposes himself to an interview with Tucker, right? He's not trying to influence the election between Biden and Trump. He's he's trying to he's he's gonna I think he's trying to humanize you know the the receptivity of a multipolar world. And and there is it because and this is blowback on how America has conducted herself as the sole superpower. We have seriously, we are crushing people and they're tired of getting crushed. And 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 so and, uh, look, I love America. Look, look, I, buy, I buy all that. Of course, that's why, and yeah. we're gonna segue and and, and and this is a perfect part to segue to what to what we're doing and why, but I've got I gotta push back slightly. Push back. On two love- different on two different because really I I love your thinking here. Okay. Because again, I'll start with my premise. America is not exporting democracy. We're not the good guys. What we're ex- what, what what I have exposed to you is we've hidden so many things that have enabled what you've said on several occasions, the the super rich. I don't want to call them the elite. They're not the elite when they steal. When they loot, that doesn't make you elite. That makes you a criminal. When our financial system, when it's the hedge funds, when it's the private as- equity guys, when it's the uh you know, um, asset management. Look, they're all crack addicts. They're crack addicts for free money, okay? That they run through these different schemes and we could go through each one on how they do it and how they loot and steal money through this facade of being able to do this short, you know, term um, margins that are only feeding the boards and the CEOs at the expense of everyone else. Okay. And again, I'm not socialist. I do believe in elements of socialism, particularly co-ops and I'm not definitely not communist, but at the same time, I understand that you have to have a hybrid economy, which we do. It just depends on, you know, where is the, the, the maximization of the efficiency and the energy and to what ends. And so what I've been arguing for the Clean New Deal and what I've been arguing since I've learned all of these things, we've got to extract ourselves from fossil fuel. We've got to create a paradigm to where we can use our technology to be able to create a new renewable um, uh, middle class that could really expand the American middle class. But see, what you're bringing up here does create a lot of complications. Now, think about how ironic this is, right? Because, like you said, Russia, India, China, Brazil, uh, South Africa, but primarily Saudi Arabia and some of the others, a lot of resources, a lot of incredible natural resources, a lot of, you know, polluting resources, okay? And here they are potentially in this multipolar world going to double down on, you know, again, a lot of the people in the third world would say, hey, easy for you to say, Mr. Middle Class American, who's had the fossil fuels that built your economy for the last 60 years that yeah. you've won from. And now you want to tell us to extract when we're, we're you're just now getting into the game. Right. And it's like, I get that. But we know the science. So the irony and it's crazy that think about this. World War Three could happen from the elites that are stealing everything from our country you know, in the name of freedom and democracy, but really for their own control, uh, you know, which which is just everything perverted inside out that I continue to try to reveal to people, you know, create a third world war with these countries trying to break away from America's central unipolar situation. But then they go by way of doubling down on fossil fuel. Uh, so it's like with the Clean New Deal, you know, it's like people they're from where I'm hearing you say it just ultimately doubles and triples down on what our our initiation is that you can't we got to have. I hate to say it like this, but I'm going to say it. it's an America first agenda. OK, but hear me out. You can't export democracy when you're not exporting democracy. You got to fix the internal mechanics of the country by purging the corruption, by being able to do a new PCORA-like scenario, given the information that we have, to get rid of the iron grip of bondage that this system that's betrayed the middle class to use the notion of the 70 trillion that they've looted over the course of the last, hey, let's add the 50 trillion that you already know that they looted from the middle class and extracted upwards, plus the set, let's call it 120 trillion for just shits and giggles and say, we need $120 trillion in 20 years to budget the transition to renewable energy, to the renewable to create the productive ca- capacity and clean up our own act 
and then see where the rest of the world goes. I mean, is that a possibility or is that like dreaming? Are we going to go into the third world war? Half the population gets blown to, to smithereens and we just double down on fossil fuel? I tell you, Patrick, it is like prophetic. So yes, you you added the 50 trillion that was extracted from working class and middle class people from 1975 to 2020, right? You know, that went up to the top 1%. And then you added the 70 trillion that was stolen, that was just that looted out of the federal treasury and, and, and the federal reserve by, by the wealthy elites. That's 120 trillion. Well, consensus, consensus estimate on what, on how much it would cost to transition the global economy to renewable energy by 2050 is 131 trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shazam. But, but here's here's the Putin's thing. not going to want to transition to renewable though. That's what you just demonstrated. No, no, no. See, here's the interesting thing. It's still a transition. In other words, we're going to need fossil fuels. Are, is going to provide the energy for the world for the next 30 years. 40 years, you know, as we make that transition. I don't think the BRICS nations, is, I prove it. I don't think the BRICS nations are resistant uh, to the- to China's reducing. the number one producer of, uh, you know, what yes. is solar yes. in the world. They they know that this is, a, that, that the planet can't sustain what they're doing. But the point is, if they control the resource on the way out the door, right? They can squeeze as much as as they can while we're closing the spigot. You see what I'm saying? I mean, but we don't have the time. Twenty. No, 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 no. That's my point. My point is, is that we still have to have. Okay, we um, right now globally, we use I think it's a hundred and seventy thousand. I forgot the unit of measure of energy, right? That's a you know. No, it's it's um it's like a gigajoule or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, no, no, you're yeah. right. Yeah, and 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 okay. So even as we, even that's expected to go up another fifty percent. So now you're talking about about two hundred and fifty thousand by twenty fifty, right? We have to replace that much energy or as much of that much energy with renewables. Right now, including nuclear, we we have twenty percent of existing. You know about thirty-five. Uh, By the way, I agreed with you on nuclear. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I said I agree with you on nuclear. Yeah, no, it, it's going to be a part of the solution. So we have to ramp up to you know from thirty-five uh, thousand uh, gigajoules or whatever to to two hundred and fifty thousand in uh, you know on near two hundred. Let's say two hundred thirty thousand by twenty fifty to to try to keep from the planet from overheating. Okay. In that ramp up period is a lot of money that because we're not going to turn out the lights on the global economy. So we will be using fossil fuels. They are consolidating the source of the money so that during that wind down period, right? Because they, because they're not trying to destroy the planet. That's why that's why China is the number one producer of renewable energy in the world. India is number two. They're going to be a part of the renewable energy transition. But in the meantime, they're the ones who are going to be selling us the oil and natural gas, other than the United States, outside of the United States. The United States has some, a great deal. In fact, the number one- No, we're the number has. one producer. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely right. But that doesn't satisfy the world's need. No. They have the lion's share of the remainder, and that's no. what I'm saying. They, you know, <laughs> the impact, the impact of them having that control and yeah. being able to, to tighten the spigot at their discretion because, but, so I wouldn't say go, it's not apocalyptic. They're not insane. They know we cannot continue to just use the fossil fuels. Okay, I agree with you, but I think they are insane, and it's not they. It's all of the elites and the oligarchs from around the world, because, look, here's another oh, facet of it. Okay? They're sociopathic. Okay. They care nothing about people. They don't care if half the right, planet, exactly. half I mean, humanity dies. No, they don't, because <laughs> that, that goes back to my previous point, though, because Russia and the oligarchs were extracting all this fat, incredible wealth, and then they're parking it in U.S. real estate markets. And stocks and bonds, they're playing the eternal game. But at what point, to, I'd love to be a fly on the wall of Putin's sort of strategy, you know, and, and, and there was a time where I thought he was, you know, so far beyond anything that the old Cold War 
Pentagon sort of generals and everything, you know, I, but then he showed a lot of like really carelessness in Ukraine so far, stuff that made me go, what is he doing? I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that are peculiar about, you know, who knows what it's like to be a head of a state. And we know that there was like over 300,000 deaths so far, I think. Yeah. In Ukraine. I don't know if that's total military or if that's just I, th I think that's I think that's the Ukrainian side that might just be the Ukrainian yeah. side and, I know and the there's Russians been a lot no there's been a lot of Russian deaths too but there's yeah, not yeah. nearly that it's much. just incredible compared to what we <laughs> yeah. in the United States could endure right because we yeah. went oh, shit during the you know 57,000 lost in Vietnam I mean we're talking in less than two years 300,000 Ukrainians I mean the, the level of misery the United States doesn't even come close to and I go back to this like this really cynical sort of play that I see you know uh, uh Tucker being involved with as a uh, vehicle to white uh you know MAGA that has all of these you know uh um uh, frustrations uh that they're going to put behind Trump right but at the same time it's like like I told you before there's this element of whether or not you know, Putin believes in it. I do think he's uses it to leverage, just like all intelligence. They turn population against population. We saw it in 2016 with the Russian troll bots and everything where you get everybody to fight each other online so that people go crazy. And these are the outcomes, right? You get everybody to fight each other and then you come and you pick up the pieces in the background, especially if, for, if it's a, a white sort of dominated movement globally, which is what I'm hearing a lot of these guys interpret, right? So I, I, I don't want to discuss that too, too far afield because I got to go and I, th th to, be, <laughs> to be continued, but I want to try to find an, uh, an exit out of this conversation to give you the final word, because again, the dilemma that I, it's not a dilemma that I have. I, this is kind of the dilemma that I had from a previous uh, discussion that we had about the world's resources and how we're going to consume and to have a sustainable planet. And, you know, and it seems to me to the powers that be, it's a lot more convenient to wipe out half the population in war that doubles down on their, 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 their entrenched power than it would be to try to manage the population's consumption of what the earth can actually provide, given the fact that the earth doesn't provide infinite resources, right? I mean, that's, right. that's, this is this reality of this equilibrium yeah. that we're in the midst of. So when we're trying to do the clean new deal in 2024, given everything that we've learned for the last 23 years, my position has always been, it's very simple. The system itself has become a criminal racket that has complete control of our supposed democracy through all of these criminalities where they've, they've completely uh, hijacked the Supreme Court, Congress, and the media, which is they've turned it into their own Politburo of deceit and deception of power that the Federal Reserve feeds and extracts to destroy the middle class. And so if the American people have two choices, as far as I can see, as massive revolution or civil war first, one way or the other, and how that all plays out, and then we pick up the pieces on the other side, or there's a third world war that forces the issue, and then who knows what happens on the other side of that, or we, the people, get hip to the facts, and we focus because the American people in America at the moment is still the indispensable nation. Maybe not for long. We still do have a Federal Reserve that can, through its sovereign currency and through fiat currency based on productive capacity, and we don't fund all of this stuff with taxes. The federal government government's spending and financing is different than state taxes and all of those things that come with it. But we have to understand the corruption that destroyed the middle class to be able to turn it upside down, inside out, to use the law to hold it accountable. And then we have to ex expand the middle class by recreating the America um, you know, of our dreams before we export it to the world, I think is where I'm sitting on this. The last thing I want to do is try to solve the world's problems when we have so much on our plate at home. No, I hear you. And that's a, that's a perfect place to leave it. I would just, the only thing I would add to that, Patrick, because what you just said, just put a bow on it. If, if replay that section, everyone listen to that statement because that that's perfect. But but in terms of the conversation we were having, in terms of Putin and Ukraine and stuff like that, it's just an opportunity for the American people to see that the stories we're being told, the narrative that we're being told, is a lie, and that what Patrick is trying to share with you. Is, is that the narrative about the American dream over the last 50 years has been a lie. And that here is the truth. Go to www.thecon.tv to learn one example of the profound, pervasive corruption 
that has that is that is draining the life out of us because they're taking all the money and they're, they're pushing it upstream right and so that's that's the takeaway you know <laughs> that's the takeaway they're lying to you they're lying to you about the overseas story they're lying to you about the domestic story but we have the truth and this is the man right here who spent 13 years and millions of dollars to try to put this together for you so it's with a, a silver platter america let the come come and eat because it's time because we got work to do and we've got allies and there's a lot of allies like us yes. out there that can bring more to the table and even though yes. we might not see things eye to eye we can work things work, work through things to be to collaborate to find smart ways to move forward that are in in you know, uh, a, a sort of humanity. I mean, it, it, it's like the, the opposite of polarization and being on your heels and defensive and wanting to crush somebody for your own outcome. I mean, look, mankind's learned that throughout history. It happens over and over and over. And th those that don't learn from history are deemed to repeat the mistakes of the past, oh. right? So the, the, we're just trying desperately to try to, to, to create a redemption because... The, yeah. We have the technology. I hate to sound like the six million dollar man. We have the, the the brilliance. We have we could put it back together. It can run faster. It can, you know. But I mean, here, here are two men right here, and I know there's many women, and I know there's many yes. people of different races and different religions and different this and that. The melting pot of Americana to to find answers to difficult solutions. But if you start with the basics and we focus. We can't fix any problem until we get rid of the tumor of corruption, my man. So I'll finish that. No, that's perfect. That is perfect. Nothing else to say. You all, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation, Patrick. I really loved it. I wish Roseanne was here right now with us, our heart and soul, because she would just she'd bring it home. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> more, more and more to add, home, my friend. <laughs> more and more to add. Thank you for everything, Kevin. We'll pick up on 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 more questions and and discussion items moving forward. But a lot will happen between now and tomorrow, I'm sure, like it does every day. All the best. Okay. Onwards and upwards. Take care.